coming this afternoon. My name is Eileen Burnell, and on behalf of the White Fund, I want to thank you for coming to our lecture today. I um, also want a quick thank you to Northern Essex Community College. They've been partnering with the White Fund since 2004 to bring you this lecture series. They do a phenomenal job. They find fantastic speakers, definitely top quality speakers that we're very proud to have. And um, the quality of the brochures and the marketing that they do for us is second to none. So we're very happy with the partnership. Thank you to Mary Ellen Ashley and Martha Levitt in particular, but thank you both. Um, today our speaker is Myrta Ojito, and I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, Myrta is a journalist first, teacher, reporter, and probably the toughest job, mom of three, so yeah. really proud of you. <laughs> um, she teaches at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. She runs seminars on immigration reporting and teaches classes on journalism writing and um, reporting and writing classes, excuse me. Um, she has been a writer herself for both the New York Times, the Miami Herald, and other periodicals. And um, today she's here to talk about her book, Finding Mignana, which is a memoir of the Cuban exodus. And um, without any further ado, let us introduce our speaker. Great. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm not sure of all the names of people responsible for me being here today, except Martha, who I've been communicating with. So thank you, Martha. And Everybody else, I, um, one of the reasons I say yes to this is because I love community colleges, I really do. I went to one myself, and um, I think the true heroes in this country are all right here, and they're all your teachers and colleagues. So we should give an applause to them, do you think? Um, I want to tell you the same thing I said to the class I went to just before coming here, that the first thing you need to know about me is that I am an immigrant. And I know in the class that I was just speaking at um, all of the students, except one or two were immigrants. But I'm curious here, how many of you are immigrants in this room or the children of immigrants? Yeah, just, uh, it feels, that's kind of what I expected because that was the impression I got from the class I went to. Um, so I want to tell you that you're all in very good company and I'm going to explain why. In 2005, two American scientists found what they call the American gene um, and they claim that Americans had deeply embedded in their bodies, in fact in their DNA, something that made them very special. And I'm not going to play the guessing game I play in the class. That is pretty much the essence of what it's to be an American, to be entrepreneurial, to be fearless, to dream, to dare, um, to plan, to wish for a better life. That is really what makes America, America. So the American gene, it's really because all of us who are here and who have been in this country for a long time came from elsewhere. America from its very beginning was, I guess, founded um, by people like you. People who dare to dream for a better life. And that's been passed on from generation to generation and it is what we have today. To leave one's country is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. It requires, um, first of all, some money you have to be able to buy the ticket or to get yourself to the border or do whatever it is you need to do to leave your village or your city. It requires a certain level of education and it requires, more importantly, the ability to dream, to hope for something better. So because of that, because, it says, because of the very nature of the act of migrating, it is already a self-selection, which means that the people who do make it to the United States are the best people in their original country, the people who are entrepreneurial enough to want to improve their lives. So keep that in mind, because I think we're all in good company. Um, I want to tell you how I came to enjoy this extraordinary group of people we call immigrants. I grew up in Cuba in the 60s and the 70s. Um, most of you were definitely not born. But this was uh, a time, for those of you who remember the Cuban Revolution, when the Cuban Revolution, um, which came to power in 1959, January 1st, 1959, was solidifying its regime and its ideas. And it did that through the children. The children tend to be victims 
in all revolutionary upheavals. And that has been the case in Cuba more than once. And I said we were victims because the children are, you know, our personalities are not yet shaped. We're very pliable. We can be molded one way or another. And this is what the Cuban government did from the very beginning. It figured if it had our souls, our brain, then it had the entire country. And in fact, that has been the case for now 50 years. I grew up in a time in which practically everything was forbidden in Cuba, including religion. If you read my book, you'll see that the first chapter is pretty much about how I was forced to leave the church when I was 10 years old because I, um, I went to church and I said I believed in God and that was not a good idea in the 70s. And so God was forbidden, but so were the Beatles. You couldn't hear rock and roll. You couldn't hear American music. Now it's okay, there's a John Lennon statue in the park in Havana, and of course the Pope went to Cuba in 1998. But when I grew up, that wasn't so cool. Uh, no one could get in, no one could get out. It was the first time, and only time, in the history of Cuba when Cuba has truly been an island. Um, and so we were sort of stuck there without the Beatles and without religion and without visas and the opportunity to leave. Um, my parents always wanted to leave Cuba, though. From the very beginning of the revolution, unlike other people who supported the regime and then did not, my parents never really liked it. And for a long time, they tried to get out in different ways, even before I was born, but they were unable to. And so I grew up sort of straddling this uh, fence in which during the day in school, I was a good communist pioneer. And at home, I was a gusana. Does anybody know what that term means? Well, it translates literally into worm. And in Cuba, it was used to label us. It was the first label I ever got in my life. I've got several. And worms were those who wanted to leave the country. We were labeled as traitors. There were other ways in which you could be a worm. You could be somebody who went to church or somebody who had relatives who lived in the United States and periodically communicated with them or you could be somebody who had somehow collaborated with the previous regime, or even if you didn't collaborate, if you had money in that regime, you were highly suspicious and probably a worm. And so I grew up in this world in which, again, during the day I was a communist pioneer, and at night at home I was a worm. My father used to hide in the bedroom, we had a one bedroom apartment, to listen to the voice of America, which is the only way we could get, we felt, unbiased information about what was going on in the world, particularly what was going on in terms of visas, because my father's obsession was to get us out of Cuba. But we had this rule in, this, in our house that we had to live together or we wouldn't leave at all. So we had to wait until it was possible for the four of us to leave together. And so we did. In uh, May of 1980, I left Cuba aboard a boat named Manana and therefore the title of my book, Finding Manana. I'm lucky that the boat was named Manana, which is a very poetic name, which of course means tomorrow, and that's what we all seek, a better tomorrow, because later I found there were boats in the harbor called Sugar Baby or My Girl Friday, <laughs> and I don't think I would have called my book Finding Sugar Baby. So I am really, really happy that I had this terrific name in my boat. In any case, we left um, in something called the Mario Boat Lift, which some of you, the older people in the audience, may remember. It was uh, a chaotic, very chaotic boat lift event in which more than 125,000 Cubans left the island in a span of five months and arrived in Key West, mostly in Key West. Um, now, at the time, I wasn't questioning too much why that had happened. It was the biggest exodus in recent history in this hemisphere, by the way. I mean, think about it, five, 125,000 people in a period of five months, that's a lot of people. Um, later, I began, began to wonder about how that had come to be, but I'll get to that later. In any case, the day I arrived from Cuba, which was May 11th, 1980, and uh, by the way, it was Mother's Day, it was the day that broke all, all records. More people arrived that one day than any other day during the boat lift. So it was also the day that began to mark a certain 
I would say, disenchantment in the media and concern the Miami Herald changed its editorial policy regarding the boat lift after that day. Up to that point, it had supported the boat lift. After that day, it began to wonder, well, maybe this is just too many people, more than we can safely have in this city. Um, I was 16 when I arrived, and I came with my parents and my sister, who was 11. I immediately went to school. I have to tell you that while I lived in Cuba, I was a very good student. I was, you know, I guess, what do you would call a teacher's pet, because I was very active, and again, I was a pioneer, and I was always participating in class. I was uh, a leader. I was definitely, I, I'm, I'm thinking, I was, I was part of student government, I guess, is the easiest way of putting it here. And everybody knew me, and I knew everybody, and I, every day in school I would stand in front of my peers and give the news of the day and, you know, all kinds of things. I can't even tell you because you wouldn't believe me how structured it was. But it was, it was a very military structure, and I basically stood in front of the entire school every day to, I guess, welcome them to their day. It's ridiculous now when I think about it, but that was what I did. So, and then all of a sudden I found myself in this country where what really mattered was the style of your hair, which was Farrah Fawcett's kind of hair, um, what you were, and more importantly, I was unable to speak. And I was just commenting to someone while we were having lunch that the most difficult thing in life, in, in your life, or in any life, is to have ideas, things you need to say and are able to articulate in your brain, but you cannot say them because you don't know the language. And I'm sure that many of you knows, know exactly what that feels like. Well, that was my life. I got here, and I had good ideas. I think I did. I just know, nobody knew it. And so I knew that people looked at me and thought that I was stupid or something, that I was 16 and unable to communicate. And that was um, incredibly hard. So the priority for me at that moment, while uh, many of my classmates were dancing and going to clubs and worrying about things like, uh, I don't know, what is it that they do in high school? The football games and there's a big dance at the end. Whatever it is people do in high school, uh, that was just not part of my life. My life was learning English. I needed to learn English as soon as I could. So I have to tell you that for the first four years that I lived here, from the time I was 16 to the time I was 20, two things happened. First, I cried every day for Cuba and what I left behind. Every day for those four days. And two, I did nothing but attempted to learn the language, and I'm still learning the language. Really, that was the focus of my life. I, don't, I, I never went dancing. I never, ever went to a club or anything like that until I was in my 20s. So um, again, that's, that's the way I handled my own displacement. I went to high school, unfortunately. I so hated high school. Graduated with a dismal GPA, 2.2, because I was in ESL classes, but the rest of my classes were regular classes, and I didn't understand a word of what the teachers were saying. And so I didn't do very well in my tests, but I managed to graduate. And so I found out, where can I go that I don't have to take something called SAT? And I was told that would be a community college. So I said, that's exactly where I'm going. And it saved me. It was Miami-Dade, at that time, Miami-Dade Community College, now Miami-Dade College in Miami. And when I went there, I immediately felt at home. Um, I felt that the people who were going to the college, and I didn't even know anything about the nature of colleges then. Now I can look back and realize what it was. They were mature. I mean, the reason why I felt at home is because the people who went to community college, just like now, are people who are there because they want to be. Nobody forces them. They could easily not go, but they're there because they want to be. And so I did. I wanted to be there. I wanted to learn. And so I immediately felt at home. I did well, um, though I, I was still reluctant to speak English because I felt I did not speak it well enough. I remember that I told my sociology teacher, Dr. Jackson, I would never forget the name, the first day of class I told him, you know, I'm, I'm a good student. I, I'll, I'll, I'll do the work, but please don't ask me to speak in class because I'm unable to speak English. And he said, but you're talking to me. And I understood what you said. So you will participate in class, and in the first oral report, you'll be the first one to speak in class. 
<laughs> and I did. And I ended up getting an A in that class. And he recommended me for a wonderful organization that I hope you have here in the campus, in the college. It's called Phi Theta Kappa. Do you have Phi Theta Kappa here? Well, Phi Theta Kappa, it's, um, why not? <laughs> I need to fix that. Phi Theta Kappa, it's um, an international honor organization for junior colleges. And when you have a good GPA, as I did at that time, I actually had a 3.9, which is pretty good. But um, I think you can join a three or higher. You become a member, and it's a wonderful organization. And I'm saying that now because they helped me tremendously, but also because I am a member of the Board of Trustees of Phi Theta Kappa now. <laughs> but at that time, I didn't even know what it was. I simply got a letter, paid my fee, went in, and what do you know? They paid for my education. They have something wonderful called a transfer scholarship. And so I went to the university because Phi Theta Kappa paid for my education. I think I would have gone anyway because I was so focused that I would have found a way, but they made it easier for me to, to pick the university. So I went to a state university that honored the scholarship, Florida Atlantic University in Boca Raton, Florida, about an hour away from home. And that's where I graduated. Um, and I think I felt that I was beginning to get the language in 1985, so it took me five years. Mind you, I really didn't have to work. I mean, I worked part-time. I had part-time jobs. In fact, at the time, I had three part-time jobs. But I didn't have to support anyone. It was just my money to pay for my things, my gasoline and my food in college. I didn't have to give any money to my house, to my household, to my parents. So I think that worked to my advantage. Also, I think the other thing that worked to my advantage is that I got here at an age, at 16, in which I totally knew my language well enough that I would never forget, but it was early on for me to learn another language. Had I, been, uh, had I arrived from Cuba in my 20s, I think the situation would have been a little bit more challenging or more difficult. Um, in any case, I graduated from Florida Atlantic University. I did very well and applied to 16 different places. And all it takes is one. One of them called and said, come up for an interview. And that was the Miami Herald. And so I got a job in the Miami Herald as a reporter in 1987. And I worked there for uh, nine years until in 1996, the New York Times called and asked me if I would move to New York and work in the New York Times. I, was I going to say no? No, of course not. <laughs> and so I moved to New York. But you know, people have asked me at times, how do you get to the Times? I mean, what did you do to get to the Times? And the answer is, I'll tell you before you ask, I never dared to dream that I would ever work in the New York Times. I did not have a plan to work in the New York Times. My only plan was to do the best I could that day, whatever day that was. And so I worked really, really hard in the Miami Herald and the Nuevo Herald. Sometimes I wrote five stories a day. Some of you, some of the writers in this room can imagine how hard that is. Um, and that's what I did. I wrote as much as I could because I figured that would be the only way of really mastering my, my craft and my art, which is journalism. And uh, eventually someone noticed, and that someone happened to be the Times. So I worked for the Times until January of 2002, at which time I already had a contract to write this book. And so let me tell you how they came about, how that came about. I was um, in New York at home, like actually going to work in the shuttle that takes me, that took me from Grand Central to Times Square where I worked. And I was reading a story in, in New Yorker magazine. And it was a story by a terrific writer named Elsa Walsh that said that um, a woman who had attempted to kill herself hadn't been successful, but she had put a gun under, a rifle under her arm, and instead of killing herself, she had blown off her arm. And so she had a fake arm. And the writer, Elsa Walsh, describes the arm as alabaster colored with perfectly shaped nails. And I remember thinking when I read that line, who do I know who has a fake arm that looks real, that is so perfect? And then the captain of the boat that brought me from Cuba came to my mind. The captain of the Mañana, whom I did not know, all I remember from him was that he had a fake arm. And I knew he had a fake arm because while we were in Cuba, it had fallen in the water, the arm. And somebody dove in, rescued it, 
and he just shook the water, put it back in. But uh, you know, in the process, and you read that in the book, my mother fainted because every, the, the arm was so perfect that everyone thought it was real and he had lost his arm. <laughs> and so I thought, at that moment I thought, gosh, I need to find this man because this man changed my life. And who is this man? And I didn't know anything. So what did I do? The class that I just spoke to? I investigated it, right? I decided that I was going to find out who this man was. I was a reporter for the Times. I certainly had the tools. At that time, the internet wasn't what it is today, but there were things that we could do. Um, and so I began looking for him. And before I got to the office that day, when I had my aha moment in the subway, I pretty much had the structure of my book in mind. Because what I began to think, and I bet all of you can do that in your own lives, is you know, who else should I be thinking of? Who else should I find and thank? And thank? Because it isn't, I mean, he was the one who brought us from Cuba. But my uncle, my father's brother, chartered a boat and went to Cuba to begin with. That boat sank. It didn't work. That's another story. It's in the book. But he, was, he first had the idea of going to Cuba. But then who was the first person who went to Cuba in a boat to get his family? And why was that allowed to begin with? Why would a country open its doors to so many people, a country like the United States, that is always attempting to restrict immigration? And why would Cuba allow so many of its good people to leave? Because I know, and I say good people on purpose, I know there is a perception that the boat lift brought a lot of criminals to the US, but that is not true. It brought a lot more good people than it brought bad people. And through the boat lift, many artists, writers, dancers, doctors, engineers, actually doctors, no, that's not true, engineers and others left through the boat lift. Some of them weren't very good people, but it was a tiny uh, minority of the, of the people who came in the boat lift. In any case, um, I quickly realized that though I thought, I had thought that I understood my own immigration story, I knew nothing. And so I needed to investigate, I needed to report it. And that's how my book came to be. And I think I want to read a section of the book now that we're talking about it. Don't worry, it's very short. I'm not going to bore you with it. Because um, this section is one that I actually never read. So I may be a little rusty in my reading here. <clears throat> but I'm reading it because in the class that I just went to, which inspired me, as classes always do, some of you were, were talking about how you would never forget the day you arrived in the United States. And so these are my first impressions, not necessarily when I arrived, that's elsewhere in the book, but when I arrived to my uncle's house, um, shortly after we actually arrived in Key West. With the first rays of the sun on May 12, we arrived at my uncle's house in a city called Tyalea. Accustomed to seeing photographs of my relatives in New York, I found Tyalea a surprise and a disappointment, just as Key West had been. There were no tall buildings, no interesting architecture, no statues, bridges, or wide avenues, no sense of a city, really. And of course, there was no snow, which you can't complain about. You have plenty here. <laughs> there were no tall buildings. No, sorry, no snow. Outside the house, pretty, with colorful gardens, it was unbearably hot. Inside, it was chilly, the hum of air conditioning following us from room to room as we examined our surroundings carefully not daring to touch anything. The ceiling sparkled and the floors were slippery. Delicate porcelain figurines filled every table and shelf. Crystal lamps with tear-shaped pendants hovered over the living room while thick, velvety drapes kept the sun out. The polished wooden table quickly filled with breakfast. Ham and cheese sandwiches and orange juice poured out of a plastic jug, not squeezed from oranges. I drank three glasses and asked for more. My uncle happily obliged. I took a long bath that left a ring of grime around the spotless white tub. A cousin I had never met before came by and gave me her old scratched sunglasses, but they fit perfectly and I was glad. I know they took me to a store where she said we could look but not buy. My uncle's wife bought me leather sandals and someone else cut my hair. I pleaded for a copy of The Catcher in the Rye and within hours, I had one, except it was in English. It didn't matter, for I knew most of it by heart. 
A picture of our family was taken in the yard, standing in front of flower and gardenias that oddly had no scent. I was assigned to my youngest cousin's bed in a room decorated with sports memorabilia and lots of shiny golden trophies. That night, when I finally lay down to sleep on sheets printed with elongated orange balls and brown helmets, an irrational thought kept me awake, how to return to Cuba on the same boat lift that had just brought me to the United States. A couple of days later, we went to a makeshift immigration office near Hialeah to register our presence in the United States. A nurse drew our blood and took chest x-rays. As we waited for the results, we were called to a long table for an interview. The bald man with a military bearing but dressed as a civilian was in charge of my file. In flawless Spanish, he asked my name. Before I could tell him, though, he said I could choose any name I wanted. I didn't have to, it didn't have to be my real name. You're in America now, he said. You can forget the past and begin anew. I thought the man was joking, but his face remained serious, waiting for my response. Thank you, I said, but I'll keep my name. I didn't tell him that my name was all I had, my name and my memories. So as you can see, and I'm sure some of you have felt this, there's a certain sense, there's a huge sense of displacement um, when I arrived, and things that were supposed to impress me about this country did not, in fact, had the opposite effect. Um, shortly after the book came out, I, oh, by the way, I should tell you that I, I left the Times to work on this book. I felt so, um, I felt that this book was something I really needed to do. I felt so strongly about it that I left my job, and everyone thought I was crazy leaving the Times, but there are things you have to do in life when you can do them, and that was the time in which I could write this book. And when I finished the book, you know, it was well received, so I got a call from the dean of the School of Journalism, and I was offered a job at Columbia, and that's um, where I'm now, at Columbia University, where I really hope that some of you, um, where I really hope that I can see some of you in the graduate program of journalism at some point in the future, because for all the troubles in the industry, and we were just talking about how difficult it is to be a journalist nowadays, Journalism, I feel, it's uh, needed more than ever. It continues to serve um, an important, a vital role in society, not only for our daily lives, but also for democracy to function as, as we know it and as we need it to function. And because of that, journalism needs people like you, people like me in a way, but more important like you, because you're younger. Um, people who are bilingual, bicultural, educated, smart, and savvy about the ways the world works and doesn't work. And so remember that you already have a huge advantage in your genes. You already have within your DNA deeply embedded the American gene. So I'm going to stop here to take your questions, and I do hope you have many questions. Thank you very much. Who's going to break the ice? The questions are the best part, really. Question. Yes. What do you think about the Cuban embargo? Should be lifted? That is so interesting. You know, when I was a reporter, I never, people ask me that question all the time. And I never answered that question because being a reporter full time and often covering issues related to Cuba, I felt that to give an answer to that question would put me in a difficult position and people would think that I had a point of view. But of course I have a point of view. We all have a point of view. The trick in journalism is not to have a point of view, but to write stories that are fair and balanced. So that's sort of the introduction. What I feel about the embargo right now, because there have been many, many years, and do you know what the embargo is? Some of the young people here? Okay. The United States has no relations with Cuba, hasn't had it for a very long time, and it doesn't permit, in theory, uh, commerce with Cuba. But the fact of the matter is that the second biggest, let me see if I remember the statistic right. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm not gonna use the statistic because I'm afraid to give you a fact that is wrong. So let me just tell you that the United States does trade with Cuba, even though there is an embargo. Cuba receives a lot of food from the U.S. on a yearly basis. I believe it's the second, either the second or the fifth 
trading partner in terms of food with, with the US. So keep that in mind. So the answer to your question is, I think it's irrelevant because the embargo at this point only exists in name, okay? Cuba can trade with any country in the world except the United States, except when it comes to food, but also except when it comes to educational materials and when it comes to art and other things. So there are a lot of loopholes. Do I think it would have made sense to lift the embargo years ago? Yes. In fact, I think it probably should have never been enacted. So I guess my answer is a little bit more complicated than a yes or a no. Because, um, you know, it's almost like I sometimes think of it as, as a diet. If you're on a diet to lose weight, the objective is to lose weight. If you keep on the same diet for 50 years and you haven't lost a pound, <laughs> I think you need to change a diet. And so if the, if, if the objective of the embargo was to remove the government of Fidel Castro, it clearly has not worked. <laughs> if that was the objective, which I don't know, I have to question it, because I know that the people of the United States are intelligent. And so therefore, I do have to question what the real intention is. So if it doesn't work, think of another strategy. Do something else, and perhaps you lose a pound or two. Yeah. In the class that you just uh, had, you went from your book when you left Cuba and how you went up above the yeah. on the boat to look at the island because you just didn't know if you were going back again. At the beginning of your book, you mentioned that you went back to Cuba when mm -hmm. the uh, Pope visited. Mm -hmm. What was it like for you? Oh, well, um, I don't know if any of you have ever gone back to the place where you were born or raised. It's a, it's a very different experience. Everything seems somehow smaller and, and, and just completely, you're very disoriented. You're not sure you belong anymore. So I remember that I arrived in Cuba. This was January 1998 when the previous pope went to Cuba for the first time. It's a huge story. This is a, it's a country that for a long time had been declared itself an atheist country. And all of a sudden, the Pope is in Cuba, and Cubans are celebrating Christmas. Very, very strange. And so I went, and I remember when I arrived, the airport was small and, and a little dirty and just run down. And uh, they asked me questions that I felt were invasive and unnecessary and intrusive. And then I went in, and the car that I had rented wasn't ready, so I had to get another car, and the, the, the traffic lights didn't work. You know, it was just kind of, I was, I really went in with a very American hat. It's like, this country, it's a third world country, it doesn't work, it's a mess, right? It's, you know, a very American attitude, to be perfectly honest. And then a colleague who had also arrived the same day from the Times called and said, we're having dinner at a restaurant, and you want to join us? And he told me where it was. What he didn't know is that I had left Cuba when I was 16, and I had never driven in Cuba. I had no idea where I was going. But I couldn't tell him that the only Cuban in the group didn't know where the restaurant was. <laughs> and so I said, sure, I'll see you there. And so I asked, you know, streets in Cuba are like in many other countries, one way, this way, the other way, like in New York. So it's complicated. And so, in streets in Havana, I should say. And so I asked, somebody in the hotel, which way do I go? He did tell me. I went and I quickly found myself in front of a malecon, which is a sea wall, which is the wall that contains a sea, barely, from coming into uh, the city. And I say barely because it often does. The sea always wins. And I remember that I was making a turn. And when I, as I did, a huge wave came down and crashed against my car. And I was really the only car, because very few people drive in Cuba. There are very few cars, despite what you see in all the pictures of the Americans who are obsessed with old cars. Very few cars. So I was the old car and the only car there. And when that wave came crashing, I felt really a wave of emotion rising within me. And I had to stop the car and just cry on my wheel of the car, because I realized, here I am. I'm in Cuba. I hadn't seen that since I left. So it was incredibly emotional for me to be welcomed by the city. I felt that I was being welcomed by the sea. You always live in Havana? I always lived in Havana, but my parents are from Las Villas, which is the central province of Cuba. And so I spent all my summers there as a child. So I have 
a very good sense of what the countryside is like, and it's um, it's it's uh, it's very dear to my heart. It's uh, in the, some of the north towns, really deep, deep towns where there was no electricity and. Um, no, Sawa is a city. Are you kidding? The Sawa La Grande is a city. No, no, this was, you know, places that were completely isolated where you couldn't go unless you walked or rode a horse, really. There's no transportation. These are really um, back country, rural, very rural. Yes. Do you have some uh, family, I suppose, uh, and some very close friends? I have very, some very, very close friends that, uh, thanks to the internet and email, we're able to communicate now. Some of them, I have some cousins, because the internet is very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, um, controlled in Cuba. So few people have access to the internet. But I have, what can I say? I happen to have brilliant friends and cousins who have really important jobs, including a nuclear physicist. That um, it's funny because she's never she's never married. She's in her early 50s, and I saw her once in Spain. And I said, "That's because when people approach you in a bar and ask you what you do, you say you are a nuclear physicist." <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, she has access to internet, and I have other friends who have access to the internet. My family does not, but my friends do, and a cousin does. And so I have some and some cousins, yeah, but not enough to allow me to go back to Cuba as a regular citizen. You may recall that Bush changed the law a few years ago. And now, according to US laws, not to Cuba's laws, but to US laws, I'm not allowed to go to Cuba to visit my relatives because I don't have relatives who are close enough, not considered close relatives. In other words, I don't have a mother, father, I guess husband, child, you know. So I'm stuck here. I can't go back unless I went with a visa as a journalist or as an academic, which you can do. But you have to tell them what you're going to investigate. And you know, I may give in and do it, but it bothers me. To have to explain the reason why I want to go back bothers me. I want to go back because I want to go back. You know, and that should be enough. But unfortunately, it isn't. For now, it isn't. Yes? You know, I don't know because that includes a lot of people. There are two million people, two million Cubans in exile. So I am definitely not qualified to tell you what the expectations of such a large group can be. But uh, my personal expectations are to be wherever my children feel at home. And this is their home. They were born here. If suddenly my children decided or told me or wanted to explore living in Cuba, I would certainly try to do that. But I can no longer see, I can actually never see myself dragging. Well, you know, before I had children, I thought I would go back in the first plane. After I had children, I don't want to do to my children what happened to me. And I'm not going to say what my parents did to me because I wanted to come. By the time we left, I definitely, I was disenchanted with the regime. And I told my father, arrange the papers, we need to leave. Mariel happened, and we didn't have to have papers, but we were ready to seek a visa elsewhere. So it wasn't done to me. I opted to come to this country. But if I take my children to my country, that's not going to be their country. So will they be out of place, as, as out of place as I feel here? You know, I, I don't think I really want to do that. But I would like, if I can help in any way through my journalism, through, through my teaching. Um, Cuba used to have a very vibrant, a very good uh, press, really excellent newspapers, that practically all of them sided with the revolution, um, even before the triumph of the revolution. And then afterwards, unfortunately, they were closed. And so the media in Cuba stayed controlled. Um, there's a lot of, as some of you may know, there are a lot of bloggers and people who somehow manage to communicate with the outside world and tell the world what is going on in Cuba. One of them was selected last year as one of Time Magazine's um, 100 People of the Year, a, a woman who blogs from, from Havana. 
So, that, you know, that's, there's, I feel like there's a seed of, of good journalism there somewhere. And if I can help through my work, I would like to do that. Yes. The actual trip. Oh, well, we see. I let the police came to the house on May seventh. Basically, they knocked on the door, and they asked um, if we were ready to abandon the country. Words matter. Words have a uh, very specific purpose, and there's a word for everything. And in Cuba, they knew that, and they used to very well. Instead of saying leaving, which they could have said, they said abandoned. And so from the get-go, we were already you know, cast as the traitors, people who were leaving their country for whatever reason, perhaps because we were blinded by the richness in the United States, or the riches in the United States. And so the police came, and they took us to a stadium-like place. It really was. It used to be a social club near the beach. And we were there for one day, spent the night there. And that's where we did all the paperwork. And then another day, we went to a place that, um, pardon the comparison, but it looked like a concentration camp because it had barbed wire officers and dogs outside. And once you were there, you were really a stateless person. They took all the documents from us, all the money. We had nothing except what we were wearing. And there's no way to go forward or back. I mean, it was just kind of stuck there in limbo. Some people were in that kind of limbo for days and weeks. I mean, fortunately for us, we were only there for one day. And then from there, they took us to the port where there was a boat waiting for us, the boat that my uncle had chartered. It was called the Valley Chief. Uh, that boat, this is, I'm trying not to go on for too long because it's, it's, it's so long that I don't want to bore you. But basically, what the government did during the days of Mariel was to try to sent anybody and everybody who had ever wanted to leave the country and couldn't find any other means of escape, and anybody and everybody that the government wanted to get rid of, whether that person wanted to leave or not. Mm -hmm. And the reasons, the categories for that, and these were real categories, they're in my book, uh, went from a, a petty thief, thief to a hardened criminal to a gay poet to just being gay or lesbian to uh, using drugs or saying you use drugs, to being against the government, to being deeply religious, a Jehovah, Jehovah Witnesses, for example. I mean, anybody that, for whatever reason, the government described as antisocial. And believe it or not, being gay in Cuba was antisocial. And so that also has changed. But that, this is the year that I'm, that I'm writing about or, or referring to. And so all of these people, of course, who had not planned on leaving, didn't have anybody who had come like my uncle did in a boat. So how do you get him out? Well, you fill the boats. And that's how come our boat sank, because a boat that was meant for 36 people brought 230. And there were more than 2,000 boats involved in the boat lift. And practically all of them were filled to capacity and beyond. And so when ours could not leave, my uncle went looking for help and found this man who had a boat, a manana, who was coming back empty because he refused to fill his boat with people he didn't know. He had asked for relatives of the people who had asked him to come to Cuba. He was an American from New Orleans. He had no relatives in Cuba. And he had asked, uh, some people had asked him to go to Cuba bring their relatives. Those people couldn't get their relatives. And so they said, that's it. We're, we're giving up. We're leaving. And as they were leaving, we needed help. And they gave it to us. So he decided to bring women and children and to tow the boat, the broken boat, the Valley Chief, with the men to international waters. And when we got to international waters in the middle of the night, he let go of the Valley Chief with my father and my uncle and other, all the other men. And we left. And we did not hear from my father and uncle until the next day. And what had happened then is that that boat sank, and my father and my uncle had to be rescued by the Coast Guard, who, by the way, are the real heroes of the story. About 25 people died in the boat lift, which is an incredibly low number. Um, given the circumstances, the, the crowded boats, the, the weather, the way it was disorganized from the beginning, 
um, and the carelessness of the Cuban government, really, it was amazing that only 25 people died. And so the Coast Guard was there in an intense, intense rescue operation. When I was already writing my book, one of the men who had chartered the boat, the Mañana, whom I had interviewed in New Orleans for my book, found in the attic um, a piece of paper, which is the piece of paper that every boat gets whenever they're leaving a port, or at least in Cuba when they're leaving the port. And this piece of paper is some kind of registry. Um, it says the name of the boat, how big it is, uh, how much it can hold, where did it come from, and where is it going, and more importantly, what it carries, what it has in it. And so this man found this piece of paper from El Mañana, or Mañana, and mailed it to me. I was almost done with the book, and I got it. And when I got it, I could not believe my eyes, because the, all the information was correct. The line in which it said what the boat carried said lastre. Does anybody know what that means in Spanish? Lastre? The way you put it in the boat. It's ballast. It's what you throw overboard. It's the stuff that you throw overboard before the boat sinks. It's worthless, really. So this is how the Cuban government defined us, as lastre. It's L-A-S-T-R-E. And I've kept a piece of paper, and I have it framed in my office to remind me of labels and to remind me of where I come from as well. Yes? I've read other Same. Yeah, I, I actually think of myself as a Cuban who lives in the United States. Um, but I, have, I no longer have any illusions as somebody who would fit in Cuba again. Because I have been marked by this 28 years, it's going to be 29 years this year, of life in this country. I mean, there are things that already, I'm sure, I, I don't see because I live here, but people from the outside say are very American about me. Um, and I felt it when I went to Cuba. When I went to Cuba, I felt very much at home. In fact, now that you mentioned that, I'm going to read perhaps um, the last part of the book that refers to that. Uh, yeah and the epilogue. Where is it? OK. <clears throat> Cuba is no longer an obsession in my life. Rather, it is the imprint of my life, a dull pain that throbs at the slightest provocation, a word I thought I had forgotten, a song that only former communist pioneers like me can still sing a black and white picture of my family circa 1970 that my mother keeps on her night table, and that chocolate colored lipstick I brought with me and is now tucked inside my medicine cabinet, just as my parents always kept the nearly empty container of Vicks Vapor Rub in theirs. Home, that elusive concept for refugees everywhere continues to evade me, like a desert mirage that grows farther the closer I seem to get to it. When I returned to Cuba in 1998, I was at home walking the streets of my childhood among the people I grew up with, but oddly out of place elsewhere. I felt incomplete, besieged by a familiar feeling of restlessness, of not really being anywhere at all. Exile, I learned then, is not a temporary condition that dissipates in the euphoria of the return. Exile, like longing, is a way of life, much like a chronic but not terminal disease with capricious symptoms, an avowed preference for a certain shade of blue, the color of my old house, I realized once I stood in front of it again, and a formerly inexplicable, almost childish delight at the way the light filters through the fiery blossoms of some South Florida, South Florida Ponciana trees, just as it does in the trees that still shade my old neighborhood, even if I'm no longer there to see them. So that's how I feel. Who betrayed? The government. 
Oh, well, I felt that before. I think my disenchantment with the Cuban Revolution began in, in when I was 10, in 1974, and I was made to really leave the church. And my teachers mocked me when I said that I believed in God. Because then I began to wonder what kind of people do this to a child, you know. And then other things happened. Barbara Walters went to Cuba and interviewed Fidel Castro, and he admitted that uh, 15,000, uh, that he had 15,000 prisoners throughout the island. And then I thought, how can there be so many political prisoners? And what's a political prisoner anyway? And then I learned about torture. And then Cubans from Miami and New York and other parts of the United States began visiting the island for the first time in 1978 and 1979. And they stayed for week-long visits. And they told us about life in the United States. And then I felt I've been lied to. I was told that the United States was a horrible, terrible, no good country. And yet my relatives are coming back with stories that in my case, I know other people lied. But in my case, my family didn't lie. My family said, it can be very hard at the beginning, but if you work hard, you get what you want. You can get an education. I remember specifically that my uncle told me, you can get loans from a bank and you can go to school. I remember that because I, I, I said to him, but you have to pay for school and you don't have to pay for school here. What if I don't have the money? And he said, yes, but you can get a loan and then you can repay it. So he never lied to me. In fact, I got better than a loan. I got financial aid and scholarships. I, I think I graduated with a with loan of $2,000 my entire career, which isn't bad. It's very good, actually. And so they never lied to us. And everything I heard, I liked. So that's when I felt lied to. And that's what helped me change my mind. So by the time I left, I was ready to leave. It doesn't mean it didn't hurt. You know, it's like a bad relationship. Have you ever been in a bad, in a bad relationship that you think, I have to leave this guy? You, you like him, you probably love him, but you have to leave him? Well, that's exactly how I felt about Cuba. I had to leave that island. That doesn't mean I didn't love it. I still do, but I had to leave. It's a very hard decision, as I said earlier. I'm sorry for coming so late. I got lost. But I did want to ask you, do you miss, do you miss being in Cuba? Do you miss Not anymore. No. no, not anymore. My life is here. I have three kids, uh, three wonderful kids. I have a great job that I love. I have incredible friends. I meet talented people every day in New York and elsewhere. Right here today, I have met incredible people. Um, and I'm just uh, constantly excited by the possibilities of this country. I mean, it's just something. Let me just tell you a little anecdote something that happened yesterday in a faculty meeting in my school. Because I think it's so telling of the way this country works. Uh, we have a monthly faculty meeting. And in this meeting, we had to select the person that we were going to have speak to the class at graduation in May. Uh, we bring two speakers, somebody who's honored for a lifelong career, somebody who should have made a mark in journalism, Somebody like, for example, Joel Lelyveld, executive editor of the New York Times, um, and others, just great journalists. Terry Gross from NPR has been one of our honorees. And is a person who addresses the students and their parents on graduation day. And then we have another speaker the day before who gives the Pringle Lecture, who should be somebody who's familiar with Washington and has written about Washington. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, Students nominate who they want to bring, and then the faculty does, and we take a vote, and we take it very seriously. This is like the highlight of the meeting. And um, one of my colleagues who directs the international program raised his hand when the, when the dean said, anybody else? And he said, I'd like to propose Alejandro Junco de la Vega. And everybody went, what? <laughs> How do you spell it? Who's that? Uh, so, so my colleague explained who Alejandro Junco de la Vega is, who is a very important publisher of the most important and relevant and courageous newspaper in Mexico right now. The man has changed the face of journalism in Mexico. And if you read anything about Mexico lately, you know Mexico is in a lot of trouble. Uh, there's talk about a possible failed state, people dying right and left, journalists getting killed. It is the second most dangerous country in the world for a journalist right now, Iraq being the first one. Yeah. And the second one is uh, Mexico. And so 
he, he, he said who he was. So other people presented other people. I mean, I'm talking big, big names, which I'm not going to mention here because I don't want you to think that he won over some of the names that you know. <laughs> but um, to the point that he had to spell it. I happened to know who he was, but many people in the room didn't know. And then the round on voting began, and he kept talking about De La Vega. And what do you know? De La Vega won. When we took the final vote, he got 18 votes. And at the end, I went to Josh, and I said, Josh, I can't believe what you did. You pulled a name out of a hat of someone nobody in this room knew, and you got him invited for this amazing award. I don't know if he's going to accept or come, so don't say anything, please. <laughs> but what Josh told me was, that's democracy. And so I have been here for almost 29, I mean 29 years. And that still, I just feel such admiration for that. For being able to, without any fear, speak up, raise your hand, say something that nobody knows what you're talking about, and win. And get people to vote for you. That, I mean, it's a simple thing. But it's, it's the American character. It's this amazing thing that we have in this country that I think we often forget because we live here. And we sometimes don't even value enough. But it's extraordinary. And so many people in other parts of the world don't have it. Just like it's a great gift. So I think that part of me is very American now. I mean, not to say that there isn't democracy in other places in the world. I know there is. I know that there are other countries in which there's, you know, democratic countries in which this happens all the time. This happens to be the one in which I live and the one I know. But I'm sure the same thing could happen in Germany or France or Spain, other places, Chile. But this is where I am. And I think we need to, we need to honor that and we need to value that. I prefer reporting. It's a really good question. I prefer reporting because I like to find out stuff. I like to know how things work. And I, and I find people endlessly interesting. I, I'm often, even when I'm being interviewed, I turn into the interviewer. I, I really think that everyone, everyone in this room certainly, um, but beyond that, I think everyone has an amazing story to tell and people are just incredible. And I also think that most people, unless they're hiding something, but even if they're hiding something sometimes, People want to tell it. People want to tell your stories. And so, you know, what better job than to be a journalist and to be there and, and get their stories and, and write it in a way that is compelling and, and interesting and hopefully that would help some people. We have time, so I'll take more questions. Yeah. Uh, as a journalist and as a writer, how do you see uh, the state of the industry? What are your opinions about what do you think is heading? What's going to happen in the next You know, I think that um, we need to understand, and I think the media has already understood, or have already understood, that um, we're in the business of news. We're not in the business of delivering the news in any particular way. Um, and if the internet is the way to go now, I think we, we get it and we're heading in that direction, and that seems to be the future. I think what's important to keep in mind is that what we teach at the journalism school, uh, the kind of journalism I do, the kind of journalism you probably admire in some of the papers you read, will not go out of fashion. It's um, the delivery, it's less important. It's like when you go to a supermarket and they ask paper or plastic, it doesn't matter. You still have to have the goods inside. <laughs> It's the same thing. Uh, you know, you'll get it whatever way you get it, but it has to be good. Or you won't read it. Or you won't read it. So the sites that are popular are the sites that are good. I mean, the New York Times, for example, has a terrific website, the Wall Street Journal, papers like that. And, and that will endure. That will still be here. I have, I'm not that pessimistic. I don't think that we're seeing the end of journalism. I think we may be seeing the end of a way to deliver journalism. Um, but it's certainly not the end of journalism. It's a different way of telling a story. Are you saying that the like, New York Times and very big names in journalism have lost a lot of authority in the sense of that we do media, anyone who doesn't even study journalism can write and be a trust, like a credible source? Mm -hmm. 
like many blowers, that between four vision, they don't even have a formal education, let alone have them even work. Can you name a blogger that has the authority of the New York Times? No. Okay. But do you think it's... You might think, but it's not true. You don't have one? Not well, even? can name one? Can somebody here name a blogger that has the authority of the New York Times? I if, think of one. Think of one. <laughs> think of one. Really, today we can find somebody uh, who without, I'm not saying that to be a good journalist, you have to have had formal education. That's yeah, not what I'm saying. I'm saying today a publication with good journalists, like the New York Times, has less authority in this country or any other country than a person who's not a good journalist. No matter how that person delivers the news, then that day it would truly be over. Because then you're dealing with the public who doesn't care about the news. You're yeah, dealing with the yeah. public who may be more interested in, I don't even know, gossip, entertainment, um, other things. I don't think we're at that point. And I frankly don't know. I mean, even bloggers use the New York Times as a source of information, right? They comment on it, but they have to read it. But you understand the value of the blog now has like, a lot, too. And yes. They are for some people, yes. Yeah. yeah. I don't, you know, what's interesting to me is that I'm going to give my students an assignment of, of blogging next week. We're, we're doing something special. And um, so to do that, I became, I began to read blogs so that I can give them an example of some of the good ones. And some of the good ones are not that different to journalism. I mean, I well, read I mean, the city blog of the New York Times. What's different from story in the local section and the city blog? So I asked the person who understands about this more than I do in our department, and he said, they're shorter. OK. It's how you empty your notebook. OK, well, that used to be called a reporter's notebook. So the good ones are really not that different to what we've always done in journalism. Yeah. And the ones that are not good are not worth reading. So, um, you know, I think it's, we all have to make personal decisions about how we spend our time and the kinds of things we input into our brain because the brain is very malleable. And I think the people who read newspapers have always been a small group of people. Yeah. I mean, think of all the millions of people who live in this country and the New York Times has, what, one point something reader, million? You know, that, that's a lot. We think it's huge, but, you know, it's, it's a tiny minority. And I think the people who read good publications will always be a self-selected group. And then everybody else will do something else. But I think it's here, journalism is here to stay. Um, I don't know, I think there is, a, there is a saying somewhere, I forget if it's in, in Spanish or in English, that it says the more you have, the more you have to do, the slower you need to go. In a way, now I, what I've all, I kind of always done that. I take it one step at a time. It's like today is today. To, all I have is today, and you know the best possible day today. It's getting studying if you have to. It's getting that A in the test. You could get a B. Would you be happy with a B? Maybe I wasn't. So if you can get an A, why would you be happy with a B? And if you can get a B, why would you be happy with a C? So that's how I have kind of led my life. Let me see if I can go for the A, at least attempt that, and one day at a time. And I'm pretty soon, one day at a time turns into a lifetime. All right? Thank you very much. You've been a terrific audience. Thank you.